The F-35 is one of the most powerful U.S. jets. Literally, no one can really compare to it, so that makes the U.S. number one in position. On average, each new jet is made using around 900 pounds of rare earth elements. Those exact elements are the ones that the US's biggest competitor, China, controls about 90% of, making the situation a lot more complicated than it seems. Rare Earth Elements, or REEs, are a group of 17 metallic minerals that are crucial for basically any high-tech device or defense mechanism. But even though they're called Rare Earth Elements, they're not exactly rare. In fact, they're pretty common to find, just not in high concentration, so it is very difficult and expensive to isolate and purify them from the rock. The metals have cool magnetic, electrochemical, and luminescent features, which, by the way, means it can send out light without getting hot. Because of that, REEs are used in numerous applications such as electronics, vehicles, medicine, technology, optics, submarines, and aircraft. For example, their strong magnetism can be used in electric vehicle motors, where each of them contains around 5 pounds of REEs. Another use of their magnetism is in wind turbines. Magnets made from REEs rotate around coils of wire, which produces electric energy that allows you to watch my videos and click the subscribe button. The same goes for the military. The US has the best military in the world, but without REEs, they'd be using pigeons instead of drones to fly over the sky. A single F-35 jet requires approximately 900 pounds of it for engines, actuators, sensor systems, basically all the stuff that makes the thing fly and shoot. And if 900 pounds sounds like a lot, for example, Virginia submarines need 10 times more. Um, obviously, since that thing is 700 times heavier than a jet. The process of separating and purifying REEs was first developed in the U.S. during the 1940s as part of the Manhattan Project, a research and development program during World War II to produce the first nuclear bombs. Scientists needed to remove REEs from uranium because they absorbed neutrons, which would prevent a nuclear chain reaction. In other words, the bomb would make a smaller boom. By doing this, they learned how to separate rare earths from other materials. And during the Cold War, while searching for uranium deposits in California, they found a huge deposit containing a lot of rare earth elements. This combination enabled large-scale production of highly purified rare earths. Cool. Between the 40s and 90s, the U.S. was by far the largest rare earth producer, with its core in the Mountain Pass Mine in California. The mine, owned by a company called Molly Corp, absolutely dominated world exports during those years, covering around one-third of total production. Which is insane if you think about it, because today we're definitely in a much better situation. During the Cold War, government-funded research significantly boosted the importance of rare earths, particularly for defense and military applications. In the 60s, for example, the U.S. Air Force invented samarium cobalt magnets, which powered advanced radar systems and missile guidance so they wouldn't blow up the White House by mistake. At the same time, they developed laser-guided weapons, all using rare earths. But it wasn't only the U.S. playing this REE game. There was also Russia. More accurately, the bigger, cooler version of Russia, the Soviet Union. The Soviets never wanted to be behind, so they also used rare earths, like scandium and aluminum, to make their MiG-29 fighter jets stronger and lighter during the 80s. Besides the army and all the fighting stuff, corporate researchers developed nickel-metal hydride batteries using lanthanum and neodymium, and neodymium iron boron magnets, which later became essential in electric motors, hard drives, and computers. REEs basically became the building blocks of modern technology, sent by something superhuman that wanted our society to prosper as fast as possible. It just forgot about one thing, the environment. Although they're crucial for almost every piece of tech, they're terrible for our planet. That's because extracting and purifying them produces massive amounts of toxic and radioactive waste, which is exactly what the Americans and Soviets were doing. REE ores often contain radioactive materials like thorium and uranium. To get one ton of purified rare earths, you can create almost double that amount of waste, including chemicals, acids, and radioactive sludge. The refining process releases poisonous gases and dust into the air, which leads to acid rain, contaminated rivers, and harmful particles that cause respiratory diseases. So in the US and Europe, stricter regulations started knocking on the door. The late 70s were dark years for tech, the military, and rare earth fans. Who's gonna save the situation? China. 
A huge country with cheap labor and fewer environmental restrictions saw this as a huge opportunity and simply jumped in. By the mid-1980s, China was rapidly scaling up, pumping out more and more rare earths each year, basically destroying the competition. And as their prices dropped, Western companies simply couldn't compete. Customers in the US, Japan, and Europe all said, screw it, and started importing from China instead. By the 90s, China had fully kicked the US out of the number one spot and become the global leader in REE exports. Rare earths simply became powerful geopolitical weapons, and no one understood that better than China. In 1992, a Chinese leader famously declared, the Middle East has oil, and China has rare earths. Spoiler alert, he was right. A few years after China had already become number one by far, the world got to taste their real power, the 2010 crisis. After territorial disagreements in the East China Sea, Japanese authorities detained a Chinese fisherman. In response, China suddenly started holding up shipments of rare earths headed for Japan. At that time, Japan was over 90% dependent on China's rare earth supply. So when those shipments stopped, an entire industry freaked out. Prices skyrocketed. Some rare earths rose by hundreds of percent in just weeks. Factories panicked. Governments panicked even more. The world realized something terrifying. Don't make China mad, or they can shut down global technology production and it's over for us. Looking at the numbers today, things aren't pretty. Between 2020 and 2023, the US imported 70% of its rare earths from China. That's extremely high. Europe isn't much better. Only 2% of Europe's rare earths are not imported from China, a 98% dependence. Basically, the US has to ask China for rare earths like a child asks a parent for approval. It's not that simple, but the conversation could look like this. Um, China, we just invented super strong drones that we plan to destroy your country with. Could we possibly import some rare earths from you so we can proceed further? Nowadays, these elements are basically everywhere. An F-35 Lightning II fighter jet alone uses about 900 pounds of rare earths in its magnets, sensors, actuators, and weapon systems. Top-tier US technology dependent on its biggest rival. Even your smartphone uses them neodymium magnets and speakers, and lanthanum and camera lenses. If something is an electronic device, it probably has rare earths inside. Fast forward to today, and we're in what many call a new Cold War. But instead of nukes, the weapons are supply chains. When the United States imposed tariffs on China in recent years, yeah, what would you expect? They fired back. Not with tariffs, but with export restrictions. In April of 2025, China restricted exports of seven heavy rare earths. Did the situation get better? Absolutely not. In October, it tightened those controls even more, surprising the US. Now China's restrictions cover 12 of the 17 known rare earths, most of them being high-value heavy ones. But then came an even bigger escalation. China passed laws saying that even foreign companies using Chinese origin rare earths would now need export licenses. This control signals a shift from economic competition to a global struggle for technological sovereignty. If they decided to cut down the supply tomorrow, what do you think it would mean for the US, Europe, and other powers? I'd like to get your opinion in the comments. Anyways, thanks for watching and see you next time. And by the way, don't forget to spam that subscribe button.